Um, so we have a lot of housekeeping to get out of the way before we actually get to jump into the program. And let me make sure I have all my stuff ready, and I do. So first off, I wanna start off with um, a land acknowledgement. Um, while many of you may be joining from elsewhere around the country or even the globe, I want to begin our time together by recognizing and honoring the indigenous peoples of this region on whose ancestral lands the Portland Art Museum now stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Motlala, Motnoma, and Watlala Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin Kalapoya who today are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and many other native communities who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also wanna recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities past, present and future and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. And I would also like to shout out land acknowledgements for our panelists. Um, Srihari is zooming in from the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Kanarsi and Munsi Lenape people. Um, Srihari pays respect to the Kanarsi and Munsi Lenape people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the diaspora. Jim is, is joining us from the lands of the Jumanos, Tonk Tonkawa, Lipan Apache. Comanche, Comanche, I apologize, um, and the Kohitekan, I apologize for pronunciation, um, communities. And Gina is joining us from the Munsi Lenape, um, from lands of the Munsi Lenape tribes. And another thing that I would like to also preface the program with as we move forward um, is the use of verbal descriptions throughout the program. So in addition to captions, um, as a part of our accessibility, we are also offering or trying our best to practice verbal descriptions as often as possible during these programs. Um, and these descriptions are important because they help for they're a helpful tool for audience members who are either blind or low vision or just audience members tuning in who cannot see the screen get a sense of who the speakers are so when i introduce myself i'll be leading with my verbal description as well as many of the other panelists that are part of this program and with that i would like to introduce myself my name is jaleesa johnston and i work as programs lead in the learning and community partnerships department at the portland art museum um, for my description, I am a black woman. Um, I'm wearing black rim glasses. I have curly black hair that's shoulder length. I'm wearing a um, dark blue hoodie and I'm sitting in a blue room and I have two um, pretty full bookcases behind me. And I'm very excited to be here today uh, sharing this lunch hour with you all. Um, and I'd love to give you a little bit of background about what Art and Conversation is. Um, art and Conversation um, before quarantining um, was a morning program that would start around 9.15 in the morning. There would be an initial hour of donuts and coffee and community and time to connect and chat. And then around 10.15, a lecture would start, and that lecture would um, usually consist of a curator talking about uh, works on view in the museum. Um, and then we would finish up the program, and then everybody who attended Art and Conversation, which has always been a free program, would then get to go into the museum for free and view the exhibitions. Um, in the past, we have played around with speakers. So in addition to curators um, at the museum, we've also included speakers from different arts organizations um, in Portland, as well as artists, as well as staff um, that are also artists and involved in some of the uh, exhibition curating and art making at the museum. And now with uh, quarantine, we are doing this virtually. It's now one hour program. It's still an awesome time to connect and to discuss art. We're still inviting a wide range of speakers to talk about a wide range of topics. Um, and one of the cool things, the sort of upside of doing a virtual program is that we get to connect with people who normally couldn't make it to the museum. So this is a really exciting moment for accessibility and that we're able to share work 
um, work within the Portland arts community to a larger audience. And now that I've told you about the background of our conversation, um, one more little tidbit of information before we get going. Uh, if you have a question at any point during this program, feel free to enter into the Q&A box and we'll be sure to make sure that the panelists all see that. And now, after all of my prefacing, I can finally jump into introducing today's art and conversation topic, um, which I'm very excited. We are joined by Amy Dodson and Ben Pop of the Northwest Film Center, along with this year's Portland International Film Festival curators, Jim Kumar, Srihari Sate, and Gina Duncan. And I'd love to introduce every single amazing person before we get going. So first, I would like to introduce Amy Dotson, who is the director of the Northwest Film Center. Amy Dotson um, is also an inaugural curator of film and new media at the Portland Art Museum in Portland. Um, she also works as one of the founding group leaders of the prestigious Venice Biennale College Cinema Program. As a story expert at the Venice Biennale XR program in Venice, Italy, and is the head of the studies at Doha Film Institute's Sierra's Series Lab. We also have Ben Pop, who is a filmmaker and curator who oversaw the long-running Northwest Filmmakers Festival, which was integrated into the Portland International Film Festival in 2020. He co-directed the Experimental Film Festival Portland along with the Micro Cinema Grand Tour, which focused on local and traveling artists working in experimental film, video, and new media techniques. In 2014, he screened 24 of his films at MUMIA, a festival of underground animation in Brazil. He is a recipient of the Oregon Media Arts Fellowship and currently is the head of art services at the Northwest Film Center. And then I'm happy to introduce Jim Komar, who is a film programmer and writer who from 2009 to 2020 curated features for South by Southwest Film Festival. His primary interest is international films with a particular focus on Latin American and Latinx films. Since 2010, he curated the SXSW Global Section for International Films and led the experimental storytelling track as part of the conference program. And we are also joined by Srihari Sate. Srihari is an independent spirit award-winning producer. His credits include It Felt Like Love, Victor, Screwdriver, The Sweet Requiem, amongst others. His feature directional debut, A Thousand Rupee Note, won the Special Jury Award and the Centenary Award for Best Film at the 2014 International Film Festival of India and has received over 35 awards. Sate is a member of the PGA, IMPPA, and SWA India. Sate is a 2013 Sundance Institute Creative Producing Fellow. He is an Adjunct Associate Professor and Senior Production Advisor at Columbia University. And we are also joined by Gina Duncan, as the producing director of the Sundance Institute, Gina Duncan works with the programming team and leads creating strategic vision and decision-making on both the Sundance Film Festival and year-round public programs. Gina previously served as vice president of film and strategic programming at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and prior to BAM was director of industry engagement and special programs at Jacob Burns Film Center. And we are in a room with a lot of amazing, amazing, amazing minds right now. So this is really exciting. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to do is start off just by talking a little bit about what the um, Portland International Film Festival is. Um, we have some slides prepared. And um, Amy, would you like to walk us through and sort of help give us some overview? Sure. Thanks for that awesome intro and the good energy this morning, Jalisa. And hi, everyone. I'm Amy, and I am a white woman with spiky blonde hair. I'm wearing some kind of multicolored caftan, and I'm sitting in a room with uh, colorful books and a photo of Jack Nicholson eating a Snickers. So if that helps set the tone, not only for uh, <laughs> where I'm sitting and, and who I am, but also um, the spirit of this call, well, hopefully that's a welcome, a welcome spirit. So 
Great. You let me know when you'd like to start, Jalisa, and we'll get those slides right up. Awesome. I'm pulling them up right now and going into present mode now. Ready. All right, mine still says loading, which we still have nine days until oh. the Portland International Film Festival loads, but here it is. So we are nine days away from the Portland International Film Festival. It's our 44th edition, and we're very excited to bring it in this um, very different environment than we have in past years. But again, the spirit and uh, the ideas of art and cinema colliding still remain. Next slide, please. So what will it look like? We have a little bit of everything. And I, I always like to say that this is a festival that is certainly for cinephiles and film lovers, but also for folks that are just interested in art and stories well told. So we have 50 films, um, media art stories and programs over those 10 days. I want to say with that, um, that we keep adding. <laughs> it's, an, it's a non-traditional festival as is, but in this, uh, in this particular time where we're on a global pandemic, we're actually closer now to 75 films uh, and new media stories. And as you can see, it's, um, it, it's quite robust. We have 40 films, um, and shorts from, from women and female identifying filmmakers, um, quite a large showing of films and shorts from the BIPOC community. And really, if anyone knows of any filmmakers working and living out of Antarctica, I think that that's almost the only place that we don't have representation. So uh, would love to know if any of you all know folks um, way down there. Um, we also have our drive-in, which is gonna be really fun here locally in Portland. Uh, featuring 10 films and shorts exploring uh, what the future can be. And that's the wonderful Ben Pop that's put together that program. So, you know, there's a little something for everyone um, each night of the festival as well. Um, there's some serious kitsch value. I'm excited that we're closing with um, David Lynch's Dune. So if you haven't gotten a chance to see that on the big screen, I, I highly recommend it. And last but not least, we have our Cinema Unbound Awards, which was something that we started last year. And I don't know about you all that are on this wonderful chat, but um, it's a year where I think we need as much inspiration as possible. So we have some folks that are local and have ties to the Portland community, but also folks out in the wide, wild, wider world that are doing really inspirational things, um, really thinking bigger, pushing folks forward to transform, not just here again in Portland, but uh, throughout the ecosystem of film. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later, later in the chat. Great, next slide. Look, there we are. <laughs> but I do wanna point out that it's, it's really a wonderful and exciting progression for the Northwest Film Center and for the Portland International Film Festival. Um, this is a time and a place where more than ever, we need multiple people at the table making decisions about what can be shown, what should be shown and how it should be shown. It can't just be one person's idea of, of, of what the festival should hold. So I'm super honored to have all of these folks that gave their time and their curatorial vision um, I've worked with some folks uh, closely in the past and others for the first time, and I just can't begin to tell you what an amazing process this has been. And I will say that the most fun was saying, there are no rules. <laughs> As a longtime curator and programmer and whatever it was called um, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, I think you know, we've all been pretty constrained by what it means to be a festival, what it means to program, what it means to curate and working with um, other artists and curators here in our Portland community, as well as each other who come from very different um, backgrounds and disciplines and even professional experience. That was the best part of this process. And we hope it's reflected in the program that we're presenting. Next slide. So how will it work? I won't go too far into this because I will just say that um, we try to make this as super turnkey, easy and equitable as possible. And the best place to go is cinemaunbound.org, which has links to all of this wonderfulness. 
But the main thing is to know is that we have stuff that is free. We have stuff that's on a sliding scale. We have beautiful films, even on opening night that we'll talk a little more about where you can choose to watch one of them or all of them. And so we wanted to give people choices and options. As Jalisa mentioned, it's great with art and conversation that maybe folks that haven't attended PIF in the past or folks that haven't come to the museum in the past can just log on anytime and explore and have an adventure. And that's true both here in the Portland metro area, but now because of the, the, the virtual nature of this, we can have folks um, throughout the US join us and see both what Northwest filmmaking and also some of those beautiful international filmmaking and storytelling is all about. Again, all this information, <laughs> for those of you who can't read as fast as me, um, <laughs> I, I have glasses, so it takes me a little bit to even focus on this. But again, this is just um, another way to say that we have a wide variety of options available for folks to participate. And for our Northwest Film Center and PAM members, a lot of perks to be able to join us in a variety of ways. And I just have to say that I'm so excited that um, one of the blessings of this time is that the Portland Art Museum and Northwest Film Center have become even more intertwined. And so again, we welcome art lovers um, as well as film lovers into the space to see what this is all about. Couple more slides, but you know, we're having a party because we're 50. And that's pretty amazing. Um, Northwest Film Center turns 50 in March. And so we are um, hosting our fundraiser with the Cinema Unbound Awards. And I would recommend that, again, those of you who are here locally that want to support us and get us into that next future 50, um, we have a really amazing evening, um, very safe, but very festive. Yes, there will be contortionists. Somebody asked me this morning, they said, there were those great contortionists last year. Are you gonna have some crazy music and contortionists? I'll just say yes. Um, and those, <laughs> those will be down at Zydell Yards. But we also, again, realize that folks may not be here in Portland or may not feel comfortable coming down to Zydell Yards um, at this moment. And so we have made the entire show also free. Um, and we are doing that in thanks to um, our partners, Gucci and Netflix, who have been um, amazing partners to ensure that folks can come and just enjoy the show um, wherever they are. And I promise you, if you've sat through these shows, I'm an Oscar nerd, so I love the full three hour, you know, with a with a pen and paper and lots of nachos, but this will be a tight 45 minutes so you can get on with your evening, but still be inspired. If anybody out there is excited about sponsorship, you let me know. We won't dilly dally too much on this, but we are still always looking for folks to be able to support the good work that the Northwest Film Center and Portland Art Museum are doing. Um, it really does ripple into our community and we need the arts now more than ever. Opening night. I'm, I'm going to let the team talk a whole lot more about this, but the idea behind it is that there is not one film that should be out there being the opening night film. Quite honestly, all of the films that are programmed in the Portland International Film Festival are, are worthy of being opening night film, but we thought that there was a really interesting conversation to be had amongst the, the selections that we made, and each one of us made a selection to be able to kind of put into the mix. Uh, I will point out that we have something that's not a film, <laughs> which I also love to always have in the mix. It's called Ghosts of Future Past, and it's something that's brought to us by Spectral Transmission. So if you've never listened to a film, <laughs> I highly recommend that you check it out. And it has, I believe, and Ben can correct me, but I want to say we're up to 18 different artists and writers and video um, collaborators that are that are riffing on this idea of Ghosts of Futures Past, and it all feels a little bit like a very funky 30s radio program. So really looking forward to uh, seeing how that interacts with Minari and The Shepherdess and The Seven Songs and some beautiful shorts, um, including I Like Tomorrow, which is making its world premiere. Two more slides, I think, and then we get to the good stuff, which is hearing everybody talk about all the work that they so lovingly programmed. Um, so many of you on this call, um, in fact, are members of the Portland Art Museum. 
and maybe haven't attended PIF in the past. And I do want to point out that if you are looking to just jump in to the deep end of the pool and really um, be focused around films where art and cinema really collide, check out our future future section. Um, again, this is a mix by all the programmers and curators on this call of, of really exciting new voices in global cinema. And so check that out. We'd love to hear what you think. And there are a number of special events um, and I call them special events because they are put together with such love and care and some of them are talks. I know Gina's talk on cinema care, which she'll introduce us to in a little bit is gonna be amazing. Um, Jim has put together, I think an improv night. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's where, where There's Smoke, which is an amazing um, choose your own adventure Zoom based documentary. And there's so much more. So I would just say, you know, there's a special tab for special events on our website that I would play with, especially all you art lovers. And this is the stuff that really is either coming out of a film and, and really broadening that idea of what cinema is and can be, or it's conversations and creativity that are using cinema as a jumping off point. So we're really excited for you all to explore those things. And I think that's the last slide. There might be lucky number 11 here, but almost done, I promise. There is lucky number 11, it's the big bang. So our Cinema About Awards, we're saving the best for last. These are the folks that we are honoring this year that are really pushing us to transform cinematic storytelling. And all of them are working at the intersection of art and cinema. And we have some really amazing um, folks that are going to be surprises as well. So we hope you will tune in and check it out. Or for those of you locally, you'll drive in and uh, experience those contortionists and a really lovely meal and celebrate with us down at Seidel Yards. All right, it's almost upon us. Here are the dates. Hopefully you have them tattooed on your heart and in your iCal, but we're just excited to get started this time next week. And then I'll turn it back over to Jalisa so that we now have the bedrock and the foundation of PIF. And now we get to hear about the good stuff because all of this isn't possible without the folks on this call and all of you who are out there in the audience who uh, make this possible. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Right, collapsing that presentation. Cool, thank you for that really, really awesome overview um, of what PIF is and what's being offered. Um, and I have some questions to get us started. Um, so if it's cool, I can just jump into those. And then again, if at any point you have a question, audience members, feel free to enter it into the Q&A box um, and we'll interweave them throughout. So. Um, it's a very open, casual conversation that we're having. Um, so my first question that I have is I'm really interested in thinking about um, this year's festival and how, I mean, for a lot of reasons, it's obviously functioning very differently from past festivals. The biggest one being that we're all quarantined, right? But <laughs> there are also um, other ways that the festival is sort of um, maybe blossoming or blooming from all of the previous festivals and the way that it's unfolded. And I was wondering if um, we could start off there, if like Amy, Ben, or even some of the curators, just your experiences with how this year's festival is coming together versus previous years would be really great for us to sort of start to wrap our brains around it. Um, I can jump in. This is Ben Pop. Um, so I am wearing um, blue framed glasses, um, curly hair and gray cardigan. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously uh, the big thing is this year's festival is virtual. So this is something that has never happened. Um, as well as it is a an amalgamation from last year's festival, which was a big shift um, in terms of incorporating the two festivals, but also um, truncating it a little bit more. So also adding in a, um, a competition section, which is the future future competition. So 
there's also, and again, what Amy had gone through with the Cinema Bound Awards, the drive-in and all that. So there's these variations of all of these different events. Um, the tricky part was essentially, how do you do events in a sphere that normally would be physical events like an opening night party, which you cannot necessarily do in a physical space now. So how to do that virtually um, while still creating the momentum of excitement um, that you would normally get with a physical festival. Um, so that's why we've added in all of these other events. We're going to be having, you know, things for the filmmakers. So like a, a virtual toast for the filmmakers, a meet and greet with all of the guest curators, um, happy hours throughout the festival that will be virtual as well. So different, different ways to beyond just the events within the festival and all the films events so that people can still interact with one another, albeit in this virtual space. Yeah, thanks. And then I'm wondering if, um, well, one of the other things too that really struck me about the, this year's festival, um, and I know this was a part of the language for last year's festival, but I feel like we've been talking about it more and more, um, is this idea of cinematic work and really embracing work that, um, it is also film, but also sort of plays with what that can be or plays with how storytelling can unfold. And for me, the spectral transmissions is like a really awesome way to automatically throw that in there to start broadening um, our thinking around, um, you know, storytelling within like a new media framework. And I was wondering if Ben, Amy, but also um, the curators, just ways that you're thinking about film or thinking about storytelling within the programming and the way that you've approached this year's festival. I'm happy to jump in. I have a Zoomy dog. So just so y'all don't think that I'm taking laps around my uh, table, but you can probably hear my Zoomy dog going around. I, I think that one of the things that we really focused on was well, there's that dog. Uh, one of the things that we really, really focused on was really taking what we had started last year and thinking about it on a core level. And what did we want to set out to do? You know, there's a lot of great festivals in our country and well beyond uh, the borders of the United States. And what did we want to do that was a little bit different? And so we really decided that we we're gonna embrace the artistic spirit and the kind of non-conformity that Portland um, is so well known for and really just double down on not being content to be contained anymore. So all those labels, all those silos, all those sections, you might notice that the festival has no sections anymore. Um, it really has its future future section, which is a wonderful mix up and mash up of different artists all over the world. But again, they really are the ones that um, have the creative and vision to really push beyond the norm. So I think that was the, again, the, the most interesting and fun part, even for me personally, who I've been doing this since dinosaurs roamed the land, was to really give ourselves that space to say, there are no rules this year. How do we put together a program that still stays to our core and still entertains our audiences and still pushes those boundaries? but without limitation. So I'd, I'd love to hear from some other programmers just about how they responded to that because there were some chuckles and then there was some genuine fear, I think, <laughs> at certain moments of like, Re really? Really, the, 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 the wheel, the training wheels are off? So. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, it's, it's interesting when you, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm Jim, I'm a very pale white man with dark hair in front of various trinkets, including a salvaged model boat and a cha-cha record. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that's interesting about the curatorial process is it takes a while for things to kind of swim into focus while you're actually um, putting films together. And I, and I noticed that a lot of the films that I was looking at were about not so much being constrained, but being under pressure. Like, how do you, how do you deal with a high pressure environment? How does that affect your creative decisions? How does it affect how you interact with people? Um, and it's, I was also wondering if, if we would start seeing more films about actually being physically constrained, but there are actually relatively few. I, I suspect that's next year and the year after we'll be seeing a lot more of those. Um, but it, it is interesting how constraint can, you know, generates creativity and the way people respond to that is really interesting. So I, I think themes have been affected by our current environment, but it's not so much the individual films themselves that necessarily take on those films. It's more of a kind of 
breadth of creativity, looking at them en masse and seeing what's emerging. And for me, I'm definitely seeing people, you know, we're under pressure. How, what do we do with this? Um, and I, I feel like that's kind of indicative of how things are working across the festival and art landscape as well. So there's a kind of like mirroring going on there. It's, it's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Thank you. I'm curious to hear from any of the other characters. Hi, I'm, I'm Sri Hari. I'm a South Asian man from India. I have uh, black hair and a beard, and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf and a, a, a dresser of sorts. Um, one of the things that I, when I was starting to think about uh, curating films for, for the festival was the idea that a lot of us are sheltering in place or staying at home. So I wanted to look at it from a flip side and look at stories and people who were displaced, uh, either due to their circumstances or um, due to political reasons or social, social political reasons from their regions. Um, and the idea of belonging, do we belong to a place or do we belong to a mindset or do we belong to the people we are around uh, uh, with? So that was sort of the approach that I, I kind of picked in terms of finding, uh, finding films for the festival. And most of the films I've uh, found for the festival were from all over the world. So it is a little challenging to be able to fit um, films from a, a global uh, industry uh, into as, as few slots, but I tried to uh, make sure there was a little bit of um, something for everyone in the audience um, uh, as, um, as you go through the program. Hi, I'm Gina Duncan. I am a black woman with glasses, wearing hoop earrings, um, and I have dimples, and my hair is straight. So I think for me, actually, it was a little daunting when Amy was like, no, no structure, do what you want. Um, I come from a community programming space, so I want to think about the community that I'm talking to um, and get as specific as possible, and didn't feel like I understood Oregon. So I kept asking, well, who comes to your festival? Who, who, who are the people in Portland? What's going on? Um, but something that I've been thinking about for a while, which I felt, you know, we all are thinking about in some way now, uh, given where we are in the pandemic, is just been about care. Um, and what does care look like? Um, and what does caring for yourself and others look like? Um, not just in, you know, uh, this idea, this self-care idea of like more bubble baths and massages, but actual, you know, significant uh, care and exchange. Even so much of this pandemic has been about um, protecting yourself and others, caring for others by your action of wearing a mask. So I was thinking about that a lot um, pre-pandemic and then it just came into focus during it. Um, and there were a few films that I had seen that I thought showed really great examples in terms of what care looks like um, um, in a capitalist society, what care looks like um, in terms of just your, you know, community, grassroots community organizing, um, and just the simple exchange of just even getting your nails done. So um, I put that together and Amy was incredibly patient with me because I also agreed to participate prior to joining Sundance and everything kind of overlapped at the same time. So it all came together. I'm here, we survived, I'm excited. But um, I'm really, you know, really looking forward to that conversation because it's one that I don't think I have an uh, answer for yet in terms of what care looks like. Um, post like well, post pandemic what 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 impact that will have and how we tell stories um how we make stories with others um and also i'm a recovering cinema operator so amy and ben um, and others on this panel will also get like what will that look like when you go back into a movie theater um and what will that interactive exchange look like and how do we manifest care in that space as well so um those are my what was going through my head Thank you. And so one, I was just sitting here listening to everybody and taking notes. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about this year's program um, is how, I mean, 
and obviously I think every year's program, it can be said for every year's program, but I'm really interested in the responsiveness to the moment and how you each are thinking about this current moment of quarantine and pandemic and within like the, your work, right? And so I'm, I'm nosy and I like to know about like your process, like your individual like process as a programmer, as a curator, as artists, right? And thinking around and engaging with work in a time that is for, at least for me, um, really difficult to stay focused and to engage. Um, and so I'm just curious about your process um, of staying engaged with your practice um, and especially around the festival, but even outside of the festival during this moment of, you know, working under the pressures of pandemic and all things virtual. Open to the, everyone. Well, I, I will say that what I'm actually doing right now is having patience with myself in terms of my process, um, recognizing that being able to really focus and watch in the way that I did uh, pre-pandemic is just been incredibly hard. Um, one would think, and I remember very much thinking like, if I only had three months to stay at home, what I could get done. Um, and now, no. so, <laughs> so I think a big part of it for me has just been patience. Um, it's also been in not watching as much Honestly, it's been a lot of um, being outside. It's been a lot of writing and reflecting on things that I have seen um, that are that keep coming up for me. And why is that? Um, just trying to take as much space and time um, as possible to be bored. Really, really resonating with um, How to Do Nothing, a book I was reading actually just before the pandemic started. And I, I really, um, really felt in those early days of the pandemic this um, push for us all to be doing as much as possible because we were in our homes and it's like proving that we're still being productive. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't give you insight onto my process because I think what I've done is just kind of put it aside for a moment. Um, but I think that's important too because I think that the way that I was working before is probably not going to be the way that I'll be working when we reemerge. Um, and so there might be some tools that I learn now that I'll take in and inform my practice uh, going forward. Yeah, I love that though, in that, I don't know, I feel like that is the process, right? Or that it's just, it's this like ebb and flow. And I think oftentimes when you're working in the arts, um, there is a heavy amount of pressure to always be doing, always be creating, always be watching, writing, thinking, critiquing, et cetera. Um, and so it is really, interesting to think that in this moment when it feels like there should be all this time to get all the things done that it's actually a moment to slow down a little bit um and that that is okay and that that's part of the process yeah yeah i, I want to follow up on that too because I, I appreciate that as well and i i'm very keen that the last year or what will end up being 18 months whatever is not seen as lost time where culture stopped community stopped, we stopped, you know, like there is, it's exactly what you just said, like there is value in, in nothing, nothing's nothing, right? But it's funny because like my process is speaking concretely is to just watch as much as possible. I'm used to high volume screening, um, which, you know, the jury's out as to whether that's the best way of doing things, but that's how I've always done it. And what, what happens when you do that is you tend to identify certain themes and certain ideas that rise up it's a really strange um i tend to think of it like a graphic equalizer for some reason like you, you you adjust the base levels and something else swims into focus and then you know like it's just a balancing act and when you start making decisions the balance becomes much more particular and much more targeted but in the initial stages i'm just watching watching and just kind of trusting that those things will emerge and then i can start kind of um you know shaping them into something else but yeah, I, I definitely think that in the last year, I've tried to be a bit more forgiving of the idea that I must be doing something highly focused at all times. Otherwise, I'm not justifying this downtime, let's call it. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think patience is very important, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird time. Yeah, most definitely. Good. 
I think going off of what uh, Gina mentioned about self-care as well. So that was something that I kind of was exploring this past year was the work-life balance um, because on top of working on, on curating uh, as part of the program, I'm also a practicing filmmaker, producer, and a professor. So how to, how to balance all of those into when, when basically everything stopped about a year ago was a good way for me to kind of collect my own thoughts and, and work out a, a routine of some sort. So when I started programming films for the festivals, one of the things I really found myself doing was uh, sort of quote unquote, having a palate cleanser as I watched films to program. I started watching movies from the eighties and nineties, trashy thrillers that I really used to enjoy to watch them between the films that I was, uh, I was watching for the festival in order to kind of excite myself. Because I remember 20 years ago when I saw that movie, I loved it, you know? And I was like, okay, I wanted to experience that again um, and, and revisit some older films in order to find new films to program for the festival. And I found that quite therapeutic. Yeah, I love that. I'm with you, Srihari. I, um, I, I, I love my, my trashy TV. As some of you know, I'm a recovering New Yorker. As few of you know, I also grew up um, spending all my summers in Oklahoma. So Teen Wolf was like the height of culture. Um, it was it was the 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 thing, right? And I, I wasn't, you know, I, I watched a bunch of great movies growing up, but that was the kind of um, diet of culture that I got. And so I found myself really reverting because I am a, a working mom. Um, and so whether it was going for a run to make space, because I had that self care moment where I was like, there's got to be better ways to have a thought that isn't about work or food than hiding in the bathroom. So how do I do that? <laughs> And so it was running and it was watching those kind of creature comforts and a huge shout out to Gina for turning me on to Ted Lasso that saved me um, from like se mid September to mid October. Um, but I think that that breakdown was also healthy in that um, I started to share that outward and I'm new to Portland and I'm new to the museum and it was a little bit risky that I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm amongst colleagues here who are at the top of their profession and they are amazing at what they do. And I was showing up for my social media posts with like how I'd fallen in love with the uh, network television show community again, because to me it was art and it was something that was comforting and was something where a lot of talented people had come together to make this super absurd weirdo, sometimes impolite and even offensive show, but there was something about it at this moment that was providing comfort. And so I think that was a really um, powerful message to me that it didn't all have to be high art. It could also be um, art for art's sake, or it could just be a great story well told. And all of those things were enough without having to categorize. And I think that really influenced how I approached all of you uh, for the festival this year. Um, a little daunting, but you know, you all embraced it in a beautiful way. Thank you. And Ben, do you have any thoughts on your process so far and pandemic? I mean, I feel like I, I feel like a lot of what was said was pretty um, similar minded, you know, and you had to take a break from things and kind of regenerate your mindset to go back in. Because I mean, even with the the process of curation there's it's it can be tricky watching so many films and especially at the you know time length you know like a, a feature that's two hours and then you know you suddenly like holy cow how am I gonna get through six of these in one day and that's 12 hours and I still need to do this and that so you know it can be it can be really exhausting and draining especially when you have like so many other things to do um, but definitely being able to take walks, have breaks, you know, dilly dally on your own kind of strange little experiments and things. Um, I, that definitely helps break it up for me and eating. I probably eat too much, but you know. And you know, well, eating's always great. So first off, I don't know if there's such thing as too much. I love my food, but also I was just thinking and listening to everybody. And I feel like that's something that's sort of reflected in the overall, um, um structure of the festival this year in past years it's always been now granted i'm like always on the sideline watching you all run around so i'm not in it the way you all were 
but it just was very like, go, go, go. And I'm sure that's still the experience for you all behind the scenes, programming and putting everything together. But on the other side as a viewer, there's a lot more, it seems like there's a lot more space to watch things, you know, uh, to tune in, you know, um, watch this, like, you know, buy a ticket, but you can watch it later, you know, just by nature of being virtual, that there is a little bit more of that fluidity um, and flexibility. And that's something that I, to me sounds really, like actually very nourishing right now, especially given all the different themes that all of the different curators are thinking about. It seems like this pro this year's PIF is really um, helping to create that nice fold for us to still engage with new media, still engage with film, still engage with cinematic stories, but also in a way that's very sensitive to the moment. And I do want to acknowledge that we do have a question in the Q&A from an audience member. So I want to make sure that we have time and get to that. So uh, this question comes from Chip Parham. The question is about process. Do you have a template for what you communicate about the submissions in your programming reviews? Hey, Chip. So I hope I'm going to answer the right question, um, but we definitely um, we have a couple of mechanisms in place. One is, you know, we we talk a little bit about <clears throat> what we're looking for um, in our submissions process, and that is going to keep growing, I think, over time um, beyond short and feature. <laughs> those are two glasses you can pour water into. Um, those aren't, um, you know, those aren't the only things that are happening within the, the kind of cinematic media. So we want to expand that. Um, certainly we have deep ties, which Ben can talk about to Northwest filmmaking. And we want to always honor that and include that in the mix. And so that's always something that we're looking for. And then as well, there, um, there are also certain parameters just of you know, how many we can take an, in a given year. And so that fluctuates a little and, and you know, we are a, qual a quality over quantity festival. Um, we also are um, a festival that doesn't get too caught up in things like premiere status. Um, and so, you know, those are, those are kind of general, general uh, answers to your specific question. But I think that, you know, we, we like many festivals um, really try and, and find a fine balance between being as open-minded and limitless as possible, but also being as kind of fiscally responsible and equitable as possible as we put together the program. Ben's been with the organization far, far longer than I, but um, maybe you can reflect a little on, on some nitty gritty um, things that you're looking for perhaps as a programmer. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's always the the side of programming where um, you have the submission process as well as curatorial process and people, there's always a healthy mix of that. Essentially, you, you very much want to look at all the submission stuff for sure. Unfortunately, there's some people who, you know, don't know about the submission process. So they, you know, they've only talked to these people up in another area or whatnot. And so you always have to reach out to different people um, as well. And then going through and as like Amy said, you know, what, what has, what are these people new? Are they older to the, to the, the scene? Um, is the, is the, is the work new and engaging? Is the work, um, is it interesting in regards to new style? Um, is it, you know, on my end, you know, regional wise, um, is it something from a particular area in the Northwest that maybe we haven't seen before? Or is it just, you know, is it more a local kind of thing that is someone, for example, you know, we have a, number, a handful of people who are finally reached a level where they have maybe a feature or something a little bit um, beyond for them. And that's really fantastic. And us being able to kind of be that first stop for them. And this has been in the past, a really nice thing with the Portland International Film Festival, a sort of launching ground for many people within the region, perhaps, you know, to suddenly because of the festival really propel outwards a little bit more and grow. And so that's, that's really an exciting aspect to it on our side of it is both in finding those stories that are being told in really interesting ways, and then the ability to kind of help help 
guide those individuals a little bit farther along. Um, and that's, that's a really, it's actually a pretty powerful and amazing thing to be a part of. Thank you. Um, and I have a question. This is uh, a little random after that last question, but it's been in my head because I've been thinking about the audience right now and thinking about the folks maybe that haven't or the people that will watch this because you know we're recording this and it'll go up on our YouTube channel. Um, for the people that'll watch this afterwards and maybe the festival's just getting going right at that point in time when they're seeing it. Um, and maybe they're not familiar, they're not sure where to go first. And so I'm just curious from you all, do you have a specific thing or a few things that you're most excited about where you're like, I'm really looking forward to this in the festival. Um, I realize that's a dangerous question because then that opens it up to like picking favorites. So I apologize <laughs> for putting y'all on the spot, but just little hints or just like little helpful um, breadcrumbs for people that are just now um, engaging with the Portland Film Festival. I would probably, I mean, I, 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 one of the th great things I like about the, the, the program is that there are, as Amy mentioned, there are no categories other than the feature feature, which is the competition section. So it's, it's pretty broad in terms of the kind of movies or where the movies are coming from. So I would really encourage the audience to explore a region or a language or a film that they haven't seen anything in before. So try, because you're in the comfort of your own home, so you don't really have to leave uh, unless you go to the drive-in. Um, so why not take a chance in something that you might have never seen before um, and, and try to exp broaden your own taste in cinema um, uh, by doing that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, de I definitely, that's, that's one ahead, of the, oh, sorry. That's one of the interesting challenges about festivals and programming in general is getting people to actually take those chances because um, you know in, in a typical festival scenario you'd have that one film you wanted to see and if you couldn't see it you would then have to just decide what to do instead well with this you have that sort of it's much easier to access those things like you say so I, I would I'm excited to see what emerges from the program as being popular with audiences because I, I think there's because there's so much access to these things I think they are more willing to take those chances that I don't know, it's, there's, there's gonna be some surprises, I think. Um, I, I hear you on the playing favorites thing. <laughs> I don't like playing that game, but there are definitely some films in particular where I'm like, I wonder what people are gonna say about this. So I, I don't really wanna name any, but I, I, that's always my favorite thing about seeing how a festival plays out in a, in, a, in a public sphere. It's like, what are people talking about? Because no matter how much planning you put into it, no matter how tightly curated something is, you can't fully predict an audience. You don't really know what they're going to gravitate towards. And that's, that's the fun of it. And, so, and often it's one of those things where you're like, oh, that unassuming little film seems to be taking off in a huge way that I really wasn't expecting. I thought it was my own niche little thing that I put in there, but no, it turns out lots of people have weird tastes also. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think um, I would just encourage folks to think about the programming a little differently that my my literal job at Pam, <laughs> but you know, the, the thing that gets me up in the morning is, you know, when it when is, you know, something cinematic, not a film. And so there's a number of things that are happening that way, both in form and in function, that tend to freak people out. They're like, I don't want to go down another Zoom call. Like I, I'm sure Lance's piece is amazing, but like it's a Zoom call. It's anything but a Zoom call. That's like going into you know, a beautiful theater and being like, yeah, it's just a screen. Um, and that's what it is. It's just a screen and it's a different screen than we're used to um, watching cinema. And we'd all rather be in a beautiful theater, I think watching some of these movies um, and honoring them in that way. But being open to that, I think is a big piece of the puzzle for the future, not only of PIF, but for the organization. And so, whether it's audio based, whether it's Zoom based, whether it's something um, that again is less about form and more about function. Um, Ben's put together a beautiful programmer with the, the filmmaker and artist Sky Hopinka, which will be available throughout. Um, and there's some other talks that we'll be doing with artists that really are playing with form 
and, and really thinking about how to not just color outside the lines, but redraw them entirely, that I think will excite not only film lovers or people interested in cinema, but people that are interested in the arts in various ways. So I think that, you know, I would just encourage folks to, um, you have carte blanche for 10 days to experiment and to try things and to take risks that, you know, is not gonna affect your pocketbook in the same way that getting a massive festival pass or even buying a handful of tickets and knowing you have to be somewhere at 7.30, um, it, it's a whole different experience. And I hope that people will take that risk and not marginalize those things because they are different than what has come before. Um, I would say, you know, Portland is a place that usually embraces those things. So I'm putting that challenge to our audience, um, new, new and members, because we had a lot of new faces as we um, developed some new programs this summer and fall. And I hope that that intermix of folks that have been coming for all 44 years of PIF and folks that maybe are either coming for the first time or are pivoting from our VR program or other things that we were doing in the new media space, um, really, really give themselves that ability to, to play. Thank you. And any other, just wanna open up, make sure. Any other things to look forward to? I would I would just add that I think um, it is important to engage with the festival um, in a way that people are most comfortable with, but also to engage with it as a festival. So to actually like put your out of office on, you know, shut the door, whatever you need to do to kind of, you know, be in a space like I am at PIF, like I am watching these films, I think is really important. Um, not just for the filmmakers who work so hard and the artists who work so hard to put this together, but also for you all in order to really be able to um, experience, uh, you know, all the work that's been put in front. So I think there's an excuse now to just like put the, turn your phone off um, and put on the out of office and just say, well, I'm at a film festival. Yeah, thank you. And I think too, just adding to that opening up, I as you all were talking, I was thinking about like all the different ways that watching something, hearing something, right, can um, open up something very visceral, right? Um, and can really like shift something in each viewer, depending on what that is. So being open to all the different aspects of the, um, I believe it's the cinematic, right, Amy, the word you're using right, the audio, sound, the visuals, but also there's writing in there, right? There's also, there's all these different little elements and so allowing yourself to be open to that. And I do wanna recognize and honor that it is our time, it's our lunch hour, um, but I also wanted to give the audience a last call for questions, now's your chance. We have these awesome, amazing curators in front of us. Um, so this is a good moment to throw in any final questions into the Q&A. And while I'm giving that moment, I do want to recognize that um, my colleague has dropped into the chat the link to Cinema Unbound. So you can also go there for more information. Well, it looks like there are no lingering questions. So <laughs> with that, I do want to uh, thank all of our panelists here and thank you, not just for your time here at Art and Conversation, but for the work that you've been putting in to put together a really awesome, awesome program for this year's festival. Um, just thank you for like sharing that, you know, part of your practice and your thinking and your work with us. And thank, thank you, you. Jaleesa. Thank you. You were awesome. We appreciate you so thank much you, and all of the learning and community partner team for putting this together. Yeah, thank you. And I hope everybody goes and checks out the Portland International Film Festival and, you know, watches and listens to some really awesome, awesome work. Cool. Well, with that, I hope you all have a happy afternoon. I hope this was a really awesome lunch hour for you. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>